Let's talk about this record. What made you say, I want to go back and find these songs and put them all in one place? It just made sense to me that uh, over the years, I've cut so many of these uh, great uh, American folk songs or blues songs, and they weren't uh, organized in any fashion. They were just, you know, one song was here, one song was there. I said, let's just take them all together. Mm-hmm. And put them out as a record, right. and uh, we had to remix a few of them. But other than that, uh, it was fun. I didn't think it would be, but it turned out to be fun to, you know, to go through all the right. old stuff and find it. Because there's a hundred more left. That was my thought because you had there were you had choices to make about what was going to be on. Yeah. You, right. Yeah. Was there a criteria for you or? Well. Uh, I have a whole nother record of, uh, if I wanted to, of soul songs. Mm. You know, uh, like, you know, I've got uh, some James Brown stuff and some James and Bobby, uh, James and Bobby Purified songs. I got a lot of old stuff, you know, that, that we recorded uh, over the years that uh, we just did for fun. You know, I have my own recording studio, so we have a lot of access to being able to just record whenever we want. Right. As I was listening, I listened to every cut yesterday. And, well, I love the Mobile Blues. Mm-hmm. And I love, is there a Robert Johnson? Yeah, Stones in My Past. Stones in My Oh my God. Just, yeah. I had a little goosebumps just thinking about it right now. Uh, I play that song live. And uh, it goes down well every night. And I know people don't know that song. <laughs> but uh, I enjoy playing it. And, and they... The audience seems to enjoy listening to it. Yeah. So. I, was, I was listening to all these cuts, and I'm link, thinking back lots of years now. There's such a specificity to your sound, right? It's, it's not, if we excuse the expression, it's not jumped up, right? There's a little accordion, might be a slide guitar, an acoustic guitar. Stuff is very, very straight ahead. Can you talk to me a little bit about what that is? What, what's the organic part of that that is, says, well, this is what I sound like? Well, I've always been with me, you know, um, following any kind of uh, trend in music is generally a mistake, I think. You know, uh, if you listen to some of the greatest records ever made, you, you really can't identify what year they were made or, you know, what was going on in the culture. They were just really magic. Like if you listen to like a Rolling Stone by Bob Dylan, it's just magic, you know. And uh, you know, Give Me Shelter by the Rolling Stones. I mean, it's just a magic song. And learning from those guys who are like 10, 15 years older than me, uh, don't hop on a bandwagon, you know, and, oh, this is popular right now, so I'm going to do it, to try to stay current, because it's a, it's a fallacy to think that you're going to be current or relevant. Trying to stay relevant is just, you know, not going to happen, because uh, every generation, you know, has their own music and you know, a 67-year-old man is just not going to be part of what an 18-year-old kid wants to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> some 18-year-old kids, maybe. So, some, yeah. You know, but, uh, you know, like my, I, I've got a couple young sons in their 20s, and they have a very big uh, base of uh, what they listen to. But basically, you know, they're, they're listening to what's popular now. Yeah. When you say those things that you just said, I think about when you're coming up and a manager says, we need to change your last name. They did that to a lot of people. (laughs) And a lot of people actually volunteered to change your name. This is a very popular girl right now. uh, I won't mention her name, but uh, she's very talented. But she's got a crazy name and dressed real crazy to get attention. And now everybody sees her for her talent. And I think that... uh, Record companies back then, you know, um, I never really understood. Uh, first of all, I never got along with them. N- never got along with the most record company people. Because I always thought, you know, 
if you know what I need to do so much, why don't you just do it and leave me out of it? <laughs> why don't you just go ahead and make the record if you know what I need to do? And, and if you don't, then why don't you just shut up? Mm. You know? And I think the shut up rang loud and clear and gave me a certain reputation inside the music business. But in the end of the day, if, if you're really an artist, right, you've got you to gotta do what you want to do. Well, uh, art is a uh, very uh, uh, magical thing that when it happens. You know, just because you write some songs and have some songs on the radio doesn't make you an artist. I live an artist's life. Every day I have to make something. I either paint, I either write, I'm either rehearsing, you know, when I'm on tour. Every performance, even though it's the same songs, is a, a new experience and I can see, try to learn from the audience. And that's what art is. Art's not being on the radio. That's the lowest common denominator. If you look at my songs that were hits, and I had a lot of them, they really weren't that good as far as uh, songs go. Mm. But they, uh, they hit the general public. And so when you're hitting the general public, you're hitting the lowest common denominator. And then, of course, they turned the music business into a business. In 1988, I saw that, and I just, I quit. You know, it's like, this is, you know. I wrote a song called Pop Singer. Never wanted to be no pop singer, never wanted to write no pop song. And a lot of people were angry about that song. And he goes, ah, Malin came spiting the hand that feeds him. Just as a member of the general public, though, mm -hmm. I need to stand up for Jack and Diane. Well, I have to tell you, uh, that song <coughs> surprises me. I can sing that song anywhere in the world and don't have to say a word. Uh, I don't, and the most, the funniest thing happened the other night. I was watching that Tyson Fury fight. And after he won the fight, he started his press conference by singing that song. So the first thing that came to my mind is, it's like, wow, that's pretty cool. A bunch of gypsies are sitting around in Birmingham, England, singing Jack and Diane, <laughs> which I kind of liked. Because <laughs> if he knows it, they know it. <laughs> Did those hit songs give you license? Oh, I had to have those hit songs because I was notoriously hated by all critics uh, because of the Johnny Cougar thing. And, you know, um, a, a lot of the critics back then, uh, and probably today, are, were very self-righteous and put a lot more importance into themselves than need be. There were a lot of magazines, you know, like Rolling Stone, who thought that they had some kind of license to... Uh, be judge and jury, you know. They just, you know, and I look back on it and I go, this was just silliness, you know. It's just, what, what, do, what do I care what a 23-year-old kid thinks about what I do? Mm. Has a lot of influence, though, like in the space. It used to. Yeah. It, it, it used to uh, uh, cover a lot of stuff, but, you know, as time went on and it became about, you know, you know, the whole music business changed, Harry, when, when they went to SoundScan. Uh, SoundScan was a uh, computerized way of counting records because it used to be that records came in at a, like, you know, you put an album out and, it, and they counted records by uh, combining all your record sales. Yeah. So you worked your way up the charts. Yeah. But SoundScan came in and it was a weekly sales thing and it became like, what did you sell that week? So you could come in at like, you know, one, and then the next week be 27. Mm. So you came in high and went down the charts, which gave no incentive for a record company to, to work for anything except for the first week. Mm. And it changed everything, and that's when rock lost its uh, ability uh, to be uh, relevant. Right. I hear exactly what you're saying. I was a music director at a radio station 40-some years ago, mm -hmm. and you, we have a thing called radio and records, mm -hmm. and it wasn't just about sales. It was, well, what are stations like you? They said, they, they're listening to this. That sounds pretty good. It's working for them. Watched it go through rotations and stuff, and songs literally climbed 
Uh, it's, yeah, and that's and, and that's the way it should be. I mean, you know, uh, that's why you know uh, when SoundScan, uh, my best friend Tim White, who was the editor of Billboard magazine, and he really toiled over the fact of I'm going to have to buy this SoundScan service because if I don't. Mm -hmm. Uh, somebody else will, and this will be, and I don't want Billboard not to be the premier. Right. So he bought that service. He knew that it was going to make urban music more popular, uh, which he, uh, you know, because it, it was all dying out at the time. But as soon as that happened, then he knew that, and the record companies figured out really quickly that, hey, we only need to deal with about 12 markets. Mm. Whereas when you were a program director, you know, St. Louis mattered, or you know, Indianapolis, Indiana mattered. Well, they, they quit mattering because if you had, you know, this station in New York City, this station in San Francisco, this station in Los Angeles, this, you know, and you just had those. And so everything became very concentrated on those 12 stations, and they were what? Right. Urban stations. Yeah. So the whole thing now, we have so many other things to talk about, but that whole thing now is how does a, how does a record drop? It's, it's success is determined the first day. Yeah, the first week. That's it. That's it. And, 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 you know, there was a time, and you can probably remember, it's like everybody knew, let's say, you know, uh, since you mentioned it, Jack and Diane, everybody knew that song. But then all of a sudden, in like the mid-90s, was like, that's the number, I don't know that song. Mm. That's the number one song in the country, and why don't I know that song? Mm. And, and the reason was is because you didn't have time to know it. You know, it didn't, it didn't. It wasn't going to get any space on the radio. It, well, it didn't build. Yeah. It, di it, it didn't work its way up the charts. Yeah. And that really screwed up uh, uh, the whole music business and, and then, you know, a lot of other things were involved. But yeah. that, that was the beginning of the end. And now, you know, I kind of feel like uh, I'm, I'm glad to have been part of this business, but now I just feel like... Uh, we're just dragging around the dead carcass of, uh, of rock and roll, a couple of us older guys. And, uh, and you know, it'll, we'll be like big bands for an example, you know, <laughs> in a few years. Tommy Dorsey and Glenn Miller. That's right. Well, okay, you can name those guys, but, you know, there were hundreds of those bands. Yeah. And, but you can only name the big ones, you know. Yeah. And uh, that same thing will happen with rock. Can I just say, as a person out there who is of a certain age, we appreciate your dragging it around. <laughs> dragging around the dead carcass of once was an entire generation's lifestyle. Yeah. And art form. Yeah. yeah. Among the songs on the, on the new album is Eye on the Prize. Mm -hmm. Why that one? I sang that song at the White House. And uh, it was uh, me and Dylan and Joan Baez and Obama had some sort of thing, and uh, oh, who were, who were performing that night? Yeah. yeah, and we all had to sing old folk songs, and that's the song that I sang. I had to learn the song, so uh, that's me learning the song, mm. you know, before I went and played it, because it was very bare bone. It's just one guitar and me and the voice, and that was it. I saw it. Oh, you did? Yeah, there's a video of it. Oh, there is. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I've never seen it. Oh, yeah, it sounds good. Uh, I thought it probably sucked. <laughs> <laughs> Are you that guy? Are you that guy? Are you... Do you appreciate what you do? Or is there a part of you that is... Could have, could have done that better. Or, geez, we didn't really knock it out tonight. Or, I didn't live up to my own standards. Well, uh, here's the way. I've always looked at things like... I want to be the best in the world, but I don't want anybody to know it. I just want to know it. I want to be the best that I can possibly be and better, but I don't need to broadcast it. I don't need anybody to say, hey, Mel Camp sold this many tickets. So that's why at the height of my career, like in 1990, I just quit and immediately went from playing, you know, double nights, triple nights in arenas to playing in theaters. And, of course, you know, the the uh, smug rock press goes, well, Mellon can't, can't sell tickets. It was like, no, 
I just don't want to play in front of a big a whole bunch of drunk people. I happen to play all my hit records. Mm. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Uh, Pete Seeger told me something, uh, uh, and he, I took it to heart. Pete goes, John, keep it small, but keep it going. If, if you want to have longevity, keep it small and keep it going. Because if you're one of these guys that need to be the biggest band in the world, you're not going to be for very long. So keep it small, get it in your head, keep it going. I'm sorry, I'm having a moment. Um, what do you mean you're having a moment? Just because, listen, I've been on Pete Seeger's uh, clean water boat. I know who Pete Seeger is. I right. know what Pete Seeger stood for right. all those years. Right. And that you're sharing this conversation that you had with him, with mm -hmm. me, is, uh, I find it kind of a big deal. Oh, good. Because I find it a big deal and I took his advice. <laughs> That's how big a deal it is. All right, we're back at it. Yes, sir. Ah, old people. We're the same age. We are, no, I'm older than you. 67. I'm 60, 67. Yeah. I may not look it, but I feel it. I feel it sometimes. Yeah. Uh, some, some days I do, some days I don't. Retirement is an Indian word for slow death, is what I found out. That's where the derivative, that's where that word came from. An American Indian word for slow death. Mm. So there's no retiring with me. No. Mm. No, they'll have to drag me off stage. As long as people show up to see me, I'm playing. How's your love life? I'm engaged to a, uh, at 67, to a very funny uh, woman, funniest woman I ever met. She, I laugh at her, she says the funniest stuff, has the best sense of humor of any woman I've ever been around. Can take a joke, can give a joke, and uh, sweet as she could be. Wow. The, um, listen, it's well publicized, they're not necessarily magazines I read with any frequency. But your uh, relationship has been sort of like an accordion. There's some days it's way out there like this, mm -hmm. and some days it's in like that. How did you figure out at 67 now, let's, let's do this thing for real? I don't know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What, I really don't know what you're talking about here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know... Um, one could well imagine I'm probably not the easiest guy to get along with. Mm. So, let's leave it at that. There you go. There you go. Talk to me about this tour coming up. We're playing a bunch of, uh, uh, I think it's 36 shows, and it's, uh, you know, places that I haven't played for a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I got some other good advice from another guy, and he looked at me and he said, John, go where they're not. Mm. Where everybody else is lining up to play, don't play there. Right. Go play somewhere else. So that's, that's what I I started doing that 20 years ago. It's like I don't play sheds, you know. I don't play arenas. Uh, you know, like in Canada, I played some. I just played an arena tour, but it's Canada, and I didn't. I didn't really. I mean, I enjoyed the people, but you know. It, it's just not fun to play in front of drunk people. Mm. It's just not. Right. I, I know it's fun for them, <laughs> but for a you know for a guy getting up there trying to <laughs> you know to sing a song, it's like. Matter of fact, I even say at the beginning of the show after about four songs, I say, "Look, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to sing some songs you know, some songs you don't know, some songs you can sing along with, and some songs you can dance to." But I'm also going to do some quiet songs. And if you're one of these people that feel like you got to yell and scream during the quiet section, would you go out in the hallway and do it? Because it's not appreciated in here. Mm -hmm. And I, I say that every night. <laughs> <laughs> I admonish them before they have it. And guess what? It works. I'll bet. Yeah, they don't, you know, nobody screams or yells. Yeah. But, you know, you go into an arena of like 10,000 people and there's going to be drunk people in there. Yeah, yeah. You know? And, uh, it's it, so good. Yeah, yeah. You know, stupid stuff, and you know, just just screaming. Yeah. I mean, people get drunk and they start screaming. I don't get it. I don't drink, so I I don't I don't know. 
I don't know what that what it's that a north is. Appeal is. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I drank when I was a kid, and I guess I did some screaming, but at a certain age, it's kind of like okay. Is touring something you look forward to, or is it what? Because it's it's a road, it's a place, it's a setup, it's a go to the next one, it's a go to the next one. Well, it traditionally it's traditionally what musicians do, and uh, I got to hold my end of the deal up and uh, keep these songs alive. Like I said, as long as people are willing to come and see me play, uh, I'm gonna be playing. How long have you been painting? I started painting, my, I've been painting my whole life, but uh, I started painting seriously during that same time period uh, when, uh, uh, when I kind of just dropped out of the music business for about three or four years. Because what happened was I dropped out in 88 for about three years, then I came back for about a year and then I had a heart attack, and then I dropped out two more years. So like there was like five lost years in there. It, it was hard to, after that heart attack, it was hard for me to like, because I was just a kid, you know, I was only 41, I think, when I had it. It's funny to say 41's a kid, but I didn't know what that meant, you know. Mm. Heart attack, I don't even have a heart attack. So anyway, I had to like get in the, and I have suffered from, uh, panic disorder and uh, anxiety my whole life since I was 19. Mm. Yeah, talking about Pete Seeger, uh, he was getting the presidential honors at the Kennedy Center and I was, uh, he'd asked me to play at that and uh, it came the day that I had to go to Washington, which was the day of the show, and I couldn't go. I had to call him and repeat, I can't make it. It was like, you can't make it. Everybody, you're supposed to be here yesterday. Yeah. So they said, I, I can't make it. I can't get on an airplane. I just can't do it. So that, that was, uh, but he forgave me for it. I, I, I explained it to him, when, you know. But I've, I've had that. But, you know, as I get older, it, it has subsided quite a bit. Uh, but as a young man, I was pretty high strung. Pretty high strung, ready to fight, you know. Mm. Wow. Fight or flight. Yeah. Panic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it is the release of adrenaline in the brain at an unwanted moment. You know, if you and I were walking down the street and we saw a dinosaur, it'd be like, "Let's take off." <laughs> but we don't. We don't have that. You know, yeah. if you just wake up in the morning and all of a sudden you have that same adrenaline rush, it does weird things to your body. Yeah. You know, your heart beats fast and. Get dizzy and nauseous. And anybody that's had panic disorder knows that it's drag. And of course, you know when I when I first had it, when I first got it in 1971, you know everybody was hippies, and of course everybody the doctors thought, well, you on drugs and all that kind of stuff. You know? But no, I'm not. Yeah. So, uh, but they didn't really diagnose it as. Here's their advice: you need to calm down. <laughs> When you're painting, mm -hmm. what does it do for you? Or, are you? or is it more about, this is what I'm trying to do when I've got a brush in my hand? Uh, painting is a uh, way to make life bearable. And it puts you in a place where you're totally focused on something. You are totally focused. Uh, like see, you see all these mirrors in here. Yeah. I made these things. Mm. I didn't buy them. I, I made them. And you know, to make a mirror like that, you see there's little pictures in there and little pictures in the mirror. And how do how do you do that? And these things are brand new, but they look like they're 150 years old. Painting with oils and stuff. I'm always just trying to keep up with uh, with my imagination, my skill does not match my imagination. <laughs> so I'm unable to apply the paint the way that I would like to uh, to the canvas and get the results that I want. So that's always a struggle. But it keep I mean, I can, I can paint for 8, 10, 12 hours every day mm. when, I'm in, when I'm home in Indiana. And that's what this place is for. When I was 
you know, uh, Meg lives here in New York, and so I need, she, there's no place to paint where she lives, so I bought this place to paint. I'm looking at one over your shoulder. I'm looking at Frida Kahlo staring back at me. Well, kind of. But it's courage. You know, courage is when you know you're licked before you even start, but you have to go through with it anyway and see it through to the end. That's what courage is. You know you're licked before you start but I'm going to do it anyway. Talk to me about the Eye on, Eye on the Prize video. I met this kid uh, a couple of years ago, and he, he could just make, you know, take nothing and make videos out of them. Hmm. He's been making my videos. I just call him up and say, here's what I want. <laughs> and then he just puts them together, and it's great. Uh, but Eye on the Prize uh, is a very pertinent song today. I mean, you know, uh, race in America uh, obviously is really, uh, under this administration, has really uh, raised its ugly head again in a way that we haven't seen but probably need uh, for years. Uh, we, we, you know, uh, as terrible and as it is with the lives lost, uh, I think it uh, is reflecting an ugly mirror uh, self-image of who we are as a nation. You know, there were a lot more commercial songs on this record than I on the prize, but uh, that wasn't the point of this record. So we made that video, and it it addresses a lot of uh, a lot of uh, those uh, things. Yeah, we're uh, getting ready. I probably shouldn't even say anything. We're getting ready to uh, mount Jack and Diane as a uh, Broadway, as a musical, and uh, it's not what you think. <laughs> it's, have a really brilliant uh, woman writing it, and uh, every problem that this country's going through today is in that musical. And uh, drug addiction, uh, racism. Uh, pollution, environmental things, it's all going to be in, on, in the show. I was asked to do this originally uh, in the early 90s, uh, and I said no, because I didn't have a good idea. Right. Uh, they probably wanted a jukebox musical. Yeah, this, this is not a jukebox musical. We're trying to make it as close to, um, our ambitions are set very high, as close to Steinbeck as we can get it. As close to Steinbeck as we can get it in today's world with these two kids. Because <clears throat> what I found out, uh, and it sounds crazy, I don't want to sound like Little Richard, but the most popular singer, most popular couples in music are, you know, uh, Frankie Lee and Johnny and uh, Jack and Diane. If you think about it, they're the most popular people. So the, the goal is, is to give them gravity and make them not just a little ditty. Give them a real life. Yeah. We'll see how it works out. Because <laughs> I'm hard to work with and I'm not a very good collaborator, so we'll see how it works out. Yeah. What an idea, though. I'm a, it's, and the girl that's writing, the woman that's writing it is really smart. Really. Yeah. She's from Kentucky, but she lives in Birmingham or somewhere like that in England. And she's, you know, she talks in high language, which I like. Mm. She talks in high language, so. Do you need an interpreter for you to communicate back and forth? Are you implying that I speak in you stupid language? <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you're doing there, here? You're a man of the people. <laughs> You were not to the manner born. I don't know what that means, but okay. <laughs> that means you weren't born with a silver spoon in your mouth. Uh, uh, no, probably not. Yeah. I, one last thing I want to say, and that is when I listened to the record, I kept thinking to myself, this feels like working people music. It is working people music. It's old blues, folk songs that you know, if I had to uh, say uh, I had an American songbook, those songs would be it. And like I said, that, you know, 
uh, those songs were recorded over the last, you know, 40 years. Some of those songs are 30 years old. Yeah. And uh, they just need to be organized, and we organized them, and, and I think it holds together surprisingly well <laughs> for the amount of time that, yeah. uh, that those things have sat around in a vault in Bloomington, Indiana. Sometimes things just need to be curated a little bit. Yeah, like us. <laughs> so appreciate it. All right. So appreciate it. <laughs>